trust that you had a restful night. I think 15, 15, 30, 15, 40. That's when they introduced this 
learning against learning. So the system of education that you have today was the tool that was presented to fight the Bible. And you will get to learn that was Thursday and Friday. So what you are using today was the weapon the Jesuits used to fight the Bible. And they have succeeded. And so when we are trying to wake people up from this stupor, sometimes it takes time. So if I am going too fast, please let me know. It took me nearly six months to get to understand the trouble that I was in, what I had gone through. So it's okay if you don't get everything now. But if you go and study, you will come to discover the danger that we are in. But the GY says that unless we understand the science of true education, we shall never have what? I've been trying to get that quotation. Where do you get that? Sometimes I tell you that whatever I would like to present here must be from scripture or spirit of Christ. I did not come to tell you my opinions. I don't have, I don't think you have time for that. Which one is that? My character and Christian education 
by A.T. Jonas. Um, it is also a very good uh, book on education. All these writers, they concur on what true education is. And of course, Ellen Pio has written education, is written uh, fundamentals. And then there's councils to parents, teachers, and students. All those books, they deal with the subject of education. And I don't know why, it's something that should have been having a big place in our church in, in terms of emphasis and training. But for some reason, there are those books that are always here. So please, let us spend time and understand this education and what it means and how it affects us and what we are supposed to do about it. Okay. As a people, we are sadly destitute of faith and love. Our efforts are altogether too feeble for the time of peril in which we live. The pride and self-indulgence, the impiety and iniquity by which we are surrounded have an influence upon us. Few realize the importance of shunning so far as possible all associations and friendly to religious life. In choosing their surroundings, few make their spiritual prosperity the first consideration. In choosing their surroundings, few make their spiritual prosperity their what? What time did you guys go to sleep? Because I can see people are still drowsy. Your brains are still slow. I'm speaking to you. You know, I can see all of you in a span. I just can't let you go. You are not alert. And you see, I requested that I have the session for education in the morning. Because I thought in the morning our minds are fresh. But our minds will not be fresh if you are a heavy supper. Our minds will not be fresh if you slept late. Okay? That's why guys are still looking at me like I am not talking to them. In choosing their surroundings, few make their spiritual prosperity the first consideration. Okay? Many times we choose where we want to stay using a commercial consideration, a financial consideration, not a spiritual consideration. And so I would like us to change our thinking a little bit and look at our, our place, our choice of a home from a spiritual perspective. After all, the Israelites, when they left Egypt, and they failed to go to Canaan. Where did God send them? Did he send them to some other fertile alternative place? Where did they stay? It was in the wilderness. I would love to have been an Israelite at that time because I didn't have to go to the shaman. Food was provided. I mean, there has never been a group so spoiled like the Israelites. God gave them food. They just had to relax and study his word. They didn't have to work. Water was there. Food they just go and collect for 40 years and they still could not come back to God. So really when God wants you to go somewhere, he will take care of you. Just take the spiritual consideration first. Oftentimes we are so worried about our daily clothing and our daily food. And Christ said, I should not bother if he feeds the rabbits and the birds of the air. You are more important than them. Parents flock with their families to the cities because they find it easier to obtain a livelihood there than in the country. The children having nothing to do when not in school obtain a strict education. From evil associates they acquire habits of vice and dissipation. The parents see all this, but it will require sacrifice to correct their error. And they stay where they are until Satan gains full control of their children. I am repeating this statement.
until you say that gains full control. So when you stay where you are because of indecision, because you can't figure out yet what to do, the longer you stay, the more Satan is going to gain control of you or your children. But there's nothing as worse as when you get to life and you realize that you have lost your children forever. They have what the world promised them to have. They have good jobs. They have good homes. But they have lost their religion. And you can see it as a parent, and there's nothing you can do about it. Because you are faithful in that which the devil offered you. You, 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 you went for it. And he fulfilled his promise. He's given you wealth, he's given your child all the comforts of this life, but there is a cost to it. Your child has lost his or her religion. Better sacrifice any and every worldly consideration than to imperil the precious souls committed to your care. They will be assailed by temptation and should be taught to meet them. But it is your duty to cut off every influence, to break off every habit, to sunder every tie that keeps you from the most free, open, and happy commitment of yourself and your family to God. Okay, so instead of the crowded city, seek some retired situation where your children will be, so far as possible, shielded from what? Temptation. And there, train them. And they take them for what? Useful. Not playing football and, and tennis, but useful labor. Okay? Now, let's look at the education of Abraham as an example. It's always good to have God's principles and then see how David applied in his people in the past. Abraham's household comprised more than a thousand souls. This is patriots and prophets. Those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God, found a home in his encampment, and here, as in a school, they received such instruction as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. How many have the book patriots and prophets? Okay, so I'm sure you're going to look at this page 141 and just look at that whole chapter because that is going to be your textbook. Okay, so he had more than a thousand souls. Abraham, more than a thousand souls in his, in his camp, right? And here, as in a school, they received the instructions as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. So as you're thinking of your country home, it's not just for you. You're going to have people that will stay with you. You will have, you will be helping other people, other students. You will have workers who will help you with the farm work. Those are your souls, and you need to minister to them. Abraham sought by every means in his power to guard the inmates, not his children, the inmates, anybody who lived within his camp, to guard them against mingling with the heathen and witnessing their idolatrous practice. For he knew that familiarity with evil would insensibly corrupt the principle. Familiarity with evil. When you are with, with evil students in secular schools, it will corrupt the what? Can a man sit on fire and not get burnt? The wise man asked that. Can a man sit on fire and not get burnt? Can he? No. The greatest care was exercised to shut out every form of false religion and to impress the mind with the majesty and glory of the living God as the true object of worship. It was a wise arrangement which God himself had made to cut off his people so far as possible from connection with the heathen, making them a people dwelling alone. So this mindset about, I want to go and stay where there are people, where I can make friends, where there are many people, that's not God's plan. 
We are living in the time of probation. We are preparing for our heavenly Canaan. And you need to prepare. How do the soldiers train? When new recruits who are training as soldiers of the Kenyan army, do they train in the city? Do they go and stay in the estates as they prepare to go and fight the enemies of Al Shabaab? Where do they train? So how can we know that so well? And we are training for the heavenly canon, and you want to train in the cities and in the apartments and in the streets of the, of the major towns and say that you are training as a soldier of the heavenly kingdom? God says that they shall be a people dwelling what? Alone. And not reckoned among the nations. He has separated Abraham from his idolatrous kindred that the patriarch might train and educate his family apart from the seductive influences which will have surrounded them in Mesopotamia. And that the true faith might be preserved in its purity by its descendants from generation to generation. So I hope we are getting to understand the purpose of true education as in we need our surroundings are important. You cannot receive true education in the wrong surroundings. He will command his household. There will be no sinful neglect to restrain the evil propensities of his children. No weak and wise indulgent favorite. No yielding of his conviction of duty to the claims of mistaken affection. How much mistaken affection do we have today by parents? The children rule nowadays. Whatever they want, the parents must work for. Mistaken affection. Abraham would not, would not only give right instruction, but he would maintain the authority of just and righteous law. I want us to make sure we understand those statements fully because this is the example that we have of true education. Abraham's location was a school. His home was a school. And he had a thousand souls. He had workers who were there. How few there are in our day who follow this example? She's asking. Prophet is asking. On the part of too many parents, there is a blind and selfish sentimentalism, miscalled love, which is manifested in leaving children with their unformed judgment and disciplined passions to control to the control of their own will. Oh, so what do you what would you like to do when you grow up? What does a child know about that? You want a child to make a decision on something they have no clue about. And so they guess something, and so the parent starts working hard to make that guess a reality. Leaving them to their unformed judgment and undisciplined passion. This is the veriest cruelty to the youth and a great wrong to the wife. That's what the prophet says. That is how the cruelest you can be to the youth. Not small children, even the youth. How many are youth today, even in university, who have no clue what they are doing? And they find out later when they are in the profession that they chose that they actually got the wrong profession. They don't enjoy their work. And so we have inefficiency in the workplace and theft and all manner of corruption because they are frustrated with what they are doing. It was never what they would have liked to do. But they were not given the right guidance. They were left alone. They were told, oh, you are free to choose. You are independent. Parental indulgence causes disorder in families and in society. It confirms in the young the desire to follow inclination instead of submitting to the divine requirements. Instead of submitting to what? God has given us a divine requirement that we should submit. We are not our own. We have been bought. We have been bought. Christ has bought us. And he has called us 
Sabi. This is not our home where you want to settle and relax and have a good time. No, we are passing. But many of us will say we are passing, but in actual fact we are firmly rooted here. And if we are living in time of probation, God has clearly told us what we are supposed to do. It is there in his word that people don't want to read it. Go ye therefore and what? What does Matthew 28 verse 19 say? That is our commission. That is our inst instruction. That is what God has given every Christian who comes to a knowledge and an acceptance of his salvation. That is what we are supposed to do as Christians. Thus they grow up with a heart averse. A heart averse. What is the word? What's the meaning of the word averse? You know, sometimes we might be assuming that we are all understanding this English. What is the meaning of the word averse? When you are averse to something, what does it mean? Sorry? When you are walking in the opposite direction, you, you are opposed to. Okay? Hostile. Hostile. Actually, hostile is a better description. You are hostile to. So, with a heart hostile to doing God's will, and they transmit their irreligious, insubordinate, cannot submit, insubordinate spirit to their children and children's children. Like Abraham, parents should command their households after them. Let obedience to parental authority be taught and enforced as the first step in obedience to the authority Not until parents themselves walk in the law of the Lord with perfect hearts will they be prepared to command their children after them. You cannot command your children when you yourself are living in violation to God's law. Children do not do what you tell them to do. They do what they see you do. So you must lead by example. A reformation in this respect is needed. A reformation which shall be deep and broad. Parents need to reform. They must teach their children that there is the voice of God addressed to them and is to be implicitly obeyed. They should patiently instruct their children, kindly and untiringly teach them how to live in order to please God. Now tell me, if these are the instructions, which teacher today, a hired teacher, can do this work? Which hired teacher can do this work? And it is a work that God himself has directed parents to do. And we are ready to delegate it to somebody else. That's fine. Maybe there is such a teacher. But how many times do we sit down and give this teacher the instructions on what he must teach the children? Is that, does that happen? In fact, many times the teachers teach, they treat parents as children. The children of such a household are prepared to meet the sophistries of infidelity. They have accepted the Bible as the basis of their faith. They have, they have accepted the Bible, not the pastor, and not the general conference, as the basis of their what? their faith. And they have a foundation that cannot be swept away by the incoming tide of skepticism. In too many households, prayer is neglected. Parents feel that they have no time for morning and evening worship. They cannot spare a few moments to, to be spent in thanksgiving to God for his abundant mercy, for the blessed sunshine and the showers of rain which cause vegetation to flourish and for the guardianship of holy angels. They have no time to offer prayer for divine help and guidance and for the abiding presence of Jesus in the household. They go forth to labor as the ox or the horse goes without one thought of God or heaven. They wake up like cows. <laughs> Do we wake up?
wake up as cows. You know how the cow wakes up? You know, I, I grew up in the farm, so I still remember how the cow wakes up. It just stands up and stretches and goes to look for grass. No time to pray. You don't see a cow kneeling to pray. They have souls so precious that rather than permit them to be hopelessly lost, the Son of God gave his life to ransom them. But they have little more appreciation of his great goodness than have the beasts that perish. It's a very sad thing. We who know the true God should have time to worship him. If you don't have time to worship God on this side of eternity, how will you enjoy being in heaven where the angels are always worshiping God? You can see now why very few people believe in eternal life. Very few people actually believe if there is even God. Among the present truth believers. Because if you don't have time to worship God, does he really exist in your mind? He doesn't. When David says that my soul panted after thee, I would rather a thousand days spent away is, is I would rather spend one day in your courts than a thousand days away from, from God's presence. If you don't have that passion, that joy to spend time in worship with God, I don't think you are even a, I think you are not different from an atheist. You don't believe in God. Because if you believe in God and you actually love that God, you would like to spend, if you have a friend, would you like to spend time with your friend? Yes. And so, it is something that we need to start cultivating. A love for worship. And morning worship, evening worship. After all, there is so much evil in a day. That's what the wise man said. Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. Not good. Evil. So if there is so much evil in one day, how much more do we need God? I wouldn't want to get out of the house if there is so much evil. Jesus Christ himself said this. Actually, not the wise man. It is Jesus Christ said, do not worry for tomorrow, for, for sufficient for the day is the what? Is the evil. So if there is so much evil in one day, then I would want to spend as much time with God so that he can shield me and protect me from that evil. Like the patches of old, those who profess to love God should erect an altar to the Lord wherever they pitch their tents. If ever there was a time when every household should be a house of prayer, it is now. Fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication for themselves and their children. Now, I want to stop there and just try to bring in perspective this concept of true education. True education includes family worship. Morning and evening worship. Now you see the trouble with the current system of education is that most schools that are where, at least where I have been staying, the students are supposed to be in school at 5 o'clock. I don't know about this side of Kenya, but on the other side, the students are reporting at 5 now. What time do they report in this side of the country? Soon. At 6 o'clock. Now if students at 6 o'clock are in school, what time did you have for morning worship? What time did you have for breakfast? And of course, they come back late, they are tired. They are not with you. The children are not yours. But true education, you wake up in the morning, you can wake up at 5, you have your morning devotion, you can have your morning worship at 6 o'clock, at 7 you can have breakfast, and at 8 you are ready for class. That is how the morning should be in a true education setting. And you can't have that in a secular world. The parent is supposed to be at work at 8. And so that is why they say that fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication. Let the father, as a priest of the household, lay upon the altar of God the morning and evening sacrifice. While the wife and the children unite in prayer and praise, in such a household, Jesus will love to tarry. So for you to have true education, then you need to make sure that you have time 
of family worship and time for the children to sing praises. I'm not speaking loud, eh? Can you hear me at the back? Sorry? I'm going to increase that volume. Okay. So, um, true education has a program, has a timetable that cannot be implemented in the cities. It has a timetable that can only work when you are living far in the countryside, where you are not under pressure to go to a Babylonian system of work, where your children are not under pressure to go into a system that demands them to go very early and come back very late. <coughs> From every Christian home, a holy light should shine forth. Love should be revealed in action. It should flow out in all home intercourse, showing itself in thoughtful kindness, in gentle and selfish courtesy. There are homes where this principle is carried out, homes where God is worshipped and truest love reigns. From these homes, morning and evening prayers are sent to God as sweet incense, and His mercies and blessings descend upon the suppliants like the morning dew. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot be saved. All can see that there is an influence at work in the family that affects the children and that the God of Abraham is with them. If the homes of professed Christians had a right religious mold, they would exert a mighty influence for good. They would be indeed the light of the world. The God of heaven speaks to every faithful parent in the words addressed to Abraham. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And so there we have the framework of how the home of a true education family should be in the countryside. This is how, these are the, the, the building blocks. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Herein lies the value of this lesson to us. We are his heirs if we link ourselves to the power of the infinite by the call of faith. Only by a life and an education as his can the kingdom of Christ be set up within. Only by a life and an education as that of Abraham can the kingdom of Christ be set up within our hearts. Did I see that statement? Let's not dare live a different kind of life than that. Such lessons made Abraham a successful teacher. Those who wished to worship the true God gathered about the tents of Abraham and became pupils in his school. God's word was the basis of all instruction as it is written. If these commandments are these, these are the commandments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that he might do them in the land which he goes to go to possess. Let's look at that verse in chapter 6. That is the key verse for true education. Now, verse 6 it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. That is the instruction. We as parents are supposed to teach these commands to our children. Lord, I felt, remember Lord's wife. Now look at another example of Lord's we have seen Abraham as an example of true education. 
where he felt that he had to follow that which God had commanded him to do and he had this household and he was the teacher and they had evening and morning worship and their life was based on the word of God. Now we look at the second class, those who are the light of Lord. Remember Lord's wife, that is the title. Lord had felt the effects of the teaching of Abraham, but through the influence of his wife, a selfish, irreligious woman. A selfish, irreligious woman. He left the altar where they once worshipped together and moved into the city of Sodom. The marriage of Lord and his choice of Sodom for a home were the first links in a chain of events fraught with evil to the world for many generations. Some of the decisions you make today about your home will not only affect you, but will affect hundreds and thousands of people after you go. And their lives and their souls will be required on your head. So don't think that you're just deciding for yourself. You are deciding for your descendants if God has not come back soon. Every act of life, however small, has its bearing for good or for evil. Faithfulness or neglect in what are apparently the smallest duties may open the door for life's richest blessings or its greatest calamities. It is little things that test the character. It is the unpretending acts of self, daily self-denial performed with a cheerful, willing heart that God smiles upon. We are not to live for self. We are not to live for, for self, but for us. And it is only by self-forgetfulness, by cherishing a loving, helpful spirit that we can make our life a blessing. The little attentions, the small, simple courtesies, go far to make up the sign, the sum of life's habits. And the neglect of this constitutes no small share of human wretchedness. It is the little things that make the sum of life's habits. Though daily distressed at beholding deeds of violence, Lord had no true conception of the debasing and abominable iniquity practiced in that vile city. Even though he saw deeds of violence, he had no idea. He did have a true conception of how vile that city was. He did not realize the terrible necessity for God's judgments to put a check on sin. Some of his children clung to sorrow, and his wife refused to depart without them. It was hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labors of his whole life to go forth a destitute wanderer. Let me tell you young people, those of you here who have not yet got anything to call yours, that if you set your home in the city, you're going to have wealth. You will have possessions and it will be extremely hard to live when you finally decide to go for the country. All that you have worked for will hold you back. And you will look at them and say, how can I do all this? Because you know, you can't move a house. You can't move it. At least not in this part of the, the world I know. There are places where you can put your house on wheels and go. But not in Africa where we build in stone. And so all the investments that you will make in the city will hold you down and you cannot move. It is easier for you now to make a move to the country when you have nothing to lose than when you have settled down and you have children and you have a religious partner who doesn't care about the country and so you are stuck and there is nothing you can do and you cannot blame God for the partner because God doesn't force a partner on you. This is the problem that Lord had. He had an irreligious partner who forced
forced him to go to Sodom. And yes, Sodom, of course, you make money. If you, spend, if you devote your time to making money, you will get it. And then the investments will tie down. Because the devil wants to attract us and entice us and pull us down in Babylon. You know, when King Darius gave the decree for the Israelites to leave Babylon, very few left. And the king gave a decree and said, let there be money to be given to for their expenses and whatever food, anything they need. He even gave his own royal guard to protect them. But Nehemiah told the king, no, you can't give us your guard because the God we worship is able to protect us. And so the king told them, please go and set up Go and build a sanctuary for your God. Go and worship your God in Jerusalem. But very few Israelites left with him. Very few. The rest were settled in Babylon. They had their businesses there. They had got married. And life was okay in Babylon. Very few people went to Jerusalem. And the same thing is happening today. We have been in Babylon for a long time. Very few people want to leave all they have and go to wander in the wilderness. Stupefied with sorrow, he lingered, loath to depart. Loath to depart. I mean, how can he leave all this? But for the angels of God, they would all have perished in the ruin of Sodom. The heavenly messengers took him and his wife and daughters by the hand and led them out of the city. They would have perished. They had literally to be dragged out of Sodom. <coughs> I don't think God is going to send another angel to drag you out of Sodom. You can't. <coughs> and today we live in Sodom. In fact, I think our cities and our generation today is worse than Sodom. And somebody said that if God doesn't come very soon, he must apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because we are worse than them. Living in that wicked city, in the midst of unbelief, his faith had grown what? That's what happens. Influence, surrounding influence has an effect on our faith. It matters not what other benefits are there. The Prince of Heaven was by his side, yet he pleaded for his own life as though God, who had manifested such care and love for him, would not still preserve him. He should have trusted himself only to the divine messenger, giving his will and his life in the Lord's hands without a doubt or a question. The angels are telling him, run to the hills. He said, no, 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 please, let me go to this small city. They still don't believe that God was able to protect them. Many of us, they don't want to go to the country. They say, no, please, let me go to this small town. Isn't it a small town? It's not so bad. If God himself had manifested no hesitancy to obey the angel's warning, but had honestly fled towards the mountains with one word of, without one word of pleading or remonstrance, his wife also would have made her escape. Did you know that? Lord, because of his hesitation, because <laughs> but his hesitancy and delay caused her to lightly regard the divine one. I we say we saw earlier that it is the little things that have disastrous consequences. Just a little delay here has an influence on somebody else. Say, ah, so and so has not made so it's okay. I'm okay. And by the time that person leaves, you, you have already decided you're not going. And you lose your life because the other person delayed that. Our actions, however small, have a repercussion that is wider than within ourselves. While her body was upon the plane, the, her, her heart clung to sorrow, and she perished with it. 
She rebelled against God because his judgments involved her possessions and her children in the ruin. There are some of us who go to the country and are still, our heart is in the city and we are wishing for the beaches and the, and the onions of Egypt. God is not pleased with that. That he was not pleased with the Israelites when they were in the desert and complaining about the plain food of man. He wanted meat. That's the same thing that happened with Lord's wife. She was in the, in the plains, but her heart was in the sea. And so she was not worthy of the salvation that God had brought for Lord's house. Although so greatly favored in being called out from the wicked city, she felt that she was severely dealt with. Because the wealth that it had taken years to accumulate must be left to destruction. Instead of thankfully accepting deliverance, she presumptuously looked back to desire the life of those who had rejected the divine warning. How many times do we desire the life of those who have rejected God's warning? The life of those that live in the sea. I hope we don't get into that class. Because I tell you, the countryside is not a walk in the park. It's a life of toil. It's a life of hardship. Because the human heart can only learn humility and submission through hardship. We can never learn humility and submission through comfort. We lost that in Eden. And that is why the ground was cast for our sake. Now that is not a cast. It is the ground that was cast for our what? When something is being done for your sake, is that negative or positive? It is positive. Because God knew that the only way to get this guy back to my image, it has to be through hardship. And so trials and hardship are God's workshop. Those are the tools he uses to build character. Amen. And so when we are out there and things are not working, that is not the time to start wishing to go back to Sodom. Sin showed her to be unworthy of life for the preservation of which she felt so little gratitude. Okay. Escape for thy life. Before the destruction of Sodom, God sent a message to God. Escape for thy life. And that is the message we have today. Escape for thy life. For those who are still dallying with the devil in the city and false education, escape for what? For your life. <laughs> Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. The same voice of warning was heard by the disciples of Christ before the destruction of Jerusalem. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, when you see when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the most countries, then it's time to flee. When you see God's servants being stopped from preaching, it is time to flee. When you see the church stopping people from coming to bring a message of hope and salvation, it is time to flee. Then let them which are in Judea flee the mountains. They must not tarry to secure anything from their possessions, but must make the most of the opportunity to escape. There was a coming out, a decided separation from the, the wicked and escape for life. So it was in the days of Noah, so with God. So with the disciples prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, and so it will be in the last days. Now tell me, what decided separation are we going to have in this last days? If it is not true education, if it is not country living, which decided separation shall we have? Again, the voice of God is heard in a message of warning. 
leading his people, separate themselves from the prevailing iniquity. Get to the country. Get to true education. The state of corruption and apostasy that in the last days would exist in the religious world was presented to the prophet. John in the vision of Babylon, that great city which reigned over the kings of the earth. Before its destruction, the cause is to be given from heaven. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of our sins, and that ye receive not of our plagues. As in the days of Noah, Lord, there must be a marked separation from sin and sinners. There can be no compromise between God and the world. No turning back to secure earthly treasures. Ye cannot serve God and Amen. Like the dwellers in the Vale of Sidim, the people are dreaming of prosperity and peace. Escape for thy life is the warning from the angels of God. But other voices are heard saying, Be not excited. There is no cause for alarm. Haven't we heard that from the Bulbins? <laughs> yes, do not be excited. The multitudes cry, Peace and safety. While heaven declares that swift destruction is about to come upon the transgressor. On the night prior to their destruction, the cities of the plain rioted in pleasure and derided the fears and warnings of the messengers of God. But those coffers perished in the flames. That very night, the door of mercy was forever closed to the wicked, careless inhabitants of Sodom. God will not always be mocked. He will not long be trifled. Behold the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. The great mass of the world, listen, the great mass of the world will reject God's mercy. And will be overwhelmed in swift and irretrievable rain. But those who heed the warnings shall dwell in the secret place of the Most High. And abide under the shadow of your mind. His truth shall be their shield and buckle. For then is the promise. With long life, let us come. And, my, and show him my salvation. In how wide contrast to the life of Abraham was that of Lord. Once they had been companions, worshipping at one altar, dwelling side by side in their pilgrim tents, but how widely separated now. Lord had chosen Sodom for its pleasure and profit. Leaving Abraham's altar and his daily sacrifice to the living God, he permitted his children to mingle with the corrupt and idolatrous people. Yet he had retained in his heart the fear of God, for he is declared in the scriptures to have been a just man. His righteous soul was vexed with the vile conversation that greeted his ears daily, and the violence and crime he was powerless to prevent. You cannot prevent. Don't deceive yourself that you will live in the city to preach for to the sin. You cannot prevent the, the crime and the sin that goes on in the city. He was saved at last as a brand plucked out of the fire. Yet, stripped of his possessions, bereaved of his wife and children, dwelling in caves like the wild beasts, covered with infamy. You know what's infamy? What's infamy? It is shame. In his old age, what the daughters did to him. Because of what they had seen. You know what Balak told the Israelites? The, the, the Balak, the king of the, the Midian, they just tell the Israelites to just come and see. Let them just come and see our, our celebration. Just by beholding. Before long, the Israelites were involved in the idolatry. And so his daughter saw what was going on in in Sodom, and now they decided to practice it on their father. And so he was covered in infamy in his old age, and he gave to the world not a race of righteous men, but two idolatrous nations, 
and enmity with God and warring upon his people <coughs> until their cup of iniquity being full, they were pointed to destruction. How terrible were the results that followed <coughs> one and wise One and wise sin. There is a way that seemed right man. But in the end thereof and the way of Say the wise, say the wise man, labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. But he that hated gifts shall be. And the apostle Paul declares, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lives, which drown men in destruction and perdition. He had, a, had he had not suffered, we would not need to follow the history. But the choice of a new home through his children were the choice of a new home through his children were. Can we read at the back? The choice of a new home through his children where? <coughs> Into the schools of the heathen. Isn't that where we are today? The schools of the heathen. Heathen are people who don't recognize or respect God. Pride and love of display were fostered. Are they not fostered in the schools of the heathen? Are they fostered? Marriage with sodomites was a natural consequence. And their final destruction in the body of the <coughs> was the terrible but inevitable result. This quoted from living, living founders of broken systems. When Lord entered Sodom, he fully intended to keep himself free from iniquity and to command his household after him. But he signally he signally failed. The corrupting influences about him had an effect upon his own faith, and his children's connection with the inhabitants of Sodom bound up his interest in a measure with theirs. The result is upon us. Many are still making a similar mistake. In selecting a home, they look more to the temporal advantages they may gain than to the moral and social influences that surround themselves and their families. They choose a beautiful and fertile country or remove to some flourishing city in the hope of securing greater possibilities, greater prosperity. But their children are surrounded by temptation and too often they form associations that are unfavorable to the development of piety and the formation of a right kind. So the consideration when you are choosing a place should not be how fertile the land is. It should not be how prosperous the place is. What should be the consideration? Huh? Where? What is the what will be the consideration? You know, if you miss this, you have missed everything. It is the character. What are the surrounding influences? Are we going to have a lot of people around? who are going to negatively influence you and your children. If that be the case, it doesn't matter how many rivers go through your land. It matters not how far the land is. That is going to be a Sodom. Because the scene of Sodom was pride and fullness of bread and idleness. Their place was fatted, they have a lot of food, so they didn't have to work so hard. And so that was the place for the devil's worship. So when you're choosing for a home, you don't have the real estate mindset. You know the real estate mindset? Eh? What, what are the, how, how does the land, you know how the, the Israelites were asking, go and check out the land. Tell us how good it is. And that one unwise step of sending spies let those Israelites never enter Kenya. So I want us to make sure we have the right list of considerations and at the top is character development. Is this going to be a place where we can develop character? Where the, a retired place, where there is quiet, where you will not be interrupted, where you are as far as possible 
from the influences and the customs of the surrounding people. The state page is a familiar one. The schools should be established where an education differing from that of the world can be given. Those of you guys who are asking, so what are we supposed to do? You should have a place where an education that is different from that of the world can be given. Because parents are unable to counteract the influence of the schools of the world. The experience of God is a forcible reminder of the truth of the statement. And the injunction to remember Lord's wife should serve as a warning to Christians against flocking into the cities to give children an education. The words of Spalding are true. Live not in a great city, for a great city is a meal which grinds all into flour. Go there to get money or to preach repentance, but go not there to make thyself a nobler man. You want to make money? Go to the city. You'll make your money there. But don't go there to become a nobler person. Can a man sit on fire and not get burnt? Can you steal from the devil and think that you can run away? The devil has set up an enterprise where you can go and make money. And so you want to go and steal from the devil. You want to go and make money but don't leave there. You think he will let you? Because that's what sometimes you want to do. You want to just go and walk there. You want to make some money but you don't want to stay there. You want to make money from the devil, you have to pay for it. The atmosphere of a lack, a lax morality of unbelief, of indifference to religious things as a tendency to counteract the influence of parents. Examples of rebellion against parental and divine authority are ever before the youth. Many form attachments to infidels and unbelievers and cast in their lot with the enemies of God. In choosing a home, God would have us consider, first of all, the what? Moral and religious influences that will surround us and our families. We may be placed in trying positions. I told you, it's not an easy walk in the, in the countryside. For many cannot have the surroundings that they would. And whenever duty calls us, God will enable us to stand and corrupt it if we watch and pray, trusting in the grace of Christ. But we should not needlessly expose ourselves to influences that are unfavorable to the formation of Christian character. When we voluntarily place ourselves in an atmosphere of worldliness and unbelief, we displease God and drive holy angels from our home. Those who secure for their children worldly wealth and honor are the expenses of eternal interests will find in the end that these advantages are a terrible yes. loss. Like Lord, many see their children ruined and barely save their own souls. Their life work is lost their life is a sad thing. Had they exercised true wisdom, their children might have had less of worldly prosperity. But they would have made sure of a title to their mortal inheritance. The two systems of education are nowhere more vividly portrayed than in the experiences of Abraham and Lot. <coughs> education in the tents of Abraham, under the guidance of the Spirit of Jehovah, brought what? eternal life. Education in the schools of Sodom brought what? Eternal death. This was not an that should be our consideration. And then all these other things will come second. It's my prayer that we make a wise choice. That we don't make the choice of Lord. For you never know whether you can even save your own soul. Let us make Lord lost he lost his possessions, he lost his family, he lost his children. Everything he had gone with to the city, he lost. And that is what actually will happen to us, except we might even lose ourselves. You may never have a chance like that. And so let us choose the life of Abraham in the tents. And God will bless us and he will keep us safe. This is my prayer. I don't know if there's any question. If you read the book, The Broken Blueprint, you will understand that the moment you start to 
uh, accredit <coughs> a school to the world, the secular schools, then you lose your independence. And it is the accreditors, those who supervise the schools and give them the accreditation, are the ones who decide what you shall teach and how you will run the school, which buildings you will erect, what courses you will offer. That is no longer a church school. So Baraton lost that very long time ago. So today it is just on its way down. I can tell you Baraton will not stay for long. It will shut down, like many of our church schools did. It will shut down or be sold. Because whenever you depart from God's plan, you don't stay. You don't survive. May God bless you. Yes. Amen. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you, Lord, because you are patient, God. You are long suffering, your mercies extend from generation to generation. And Lord, we belong in Sodom. We have joined the Sodomites and the Gomorrah and all the lifestyle. We have been doing business in Sodom. We have been in the schools of Sodom. And our eyes have been familiar, but we held evil. Lord, we thank you because this day you brought us the truth of the two angels who have come to save us from destruction. It is my prayer that we shall take all of your hands tonight and just leave and go out to the mountains where we shall secure our character for eternity. Lord, may you give us the courage that we can leave our cherished possessions, our cherished links and family ties and go where God your Designed for us a place that we shall develop character, where we shall truly worship you like the Israelites were removed from Egypt and had to dwell in the wilderness where they could worship you and where you gave them your law. I pray, Lord, that every young person, every member, everyone who has come here, may you, Lord, not give them peace. May they make a decision to choose the correct type of education. Some have gone through the wrong education. And you need to take them like Moses to the wilderness to take care of sheep for 40 years. And so those that are already in the schools of Babylon, do not you need to pluck out as a brand pluck out of the fire. May they not delay their decision. For the longer they delay, the more sure the devil is going to hold upon them. And Lord, you know that many who have received these messages, who have been convinced Whenever they delay, whenever they hesitate, it is seldom that they will ever come back. I pray that they do not delay those that are here today. And Lord, may make arrangements to accept your word and move by faith. It is my prayer that you continue to guide us and continue to give us your spirit to encourage us to obey like the patriots of old. It's our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.